Orlando's going to the games every weekend. I'm an alumni, and they're proud of it. Colleges and universities are nothing but bastions of gnosis. That's where you got your education. That's where you became a humanitarian. That's where they taught you the humanities, which is nothing but the philosophy of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and the, what the Bible calls what? The wisdom of this world. And they taught your mind to be twofold, threefold, fivefold the enemy of God. Why? Because now I know something. Gary Harrison said something to me the other day that was very astute. And I, talk, and I thought about that after he said it after I got through talking to him. He said, I used to teach the disciplines of listening. He says, what, what undermines most listening is a person does not think about what you're saying. They think about what they think about what you're saying. And that hit me. I got off the phone after talking to him. I said, I got off the phone. I said, you know what? That's right. They don't evaluate and think about what you're saying. They are evaluating what they think about what they think about what you're saying. They can't even hear you. Because they already got a belief system and what they think embedded in them. So they're evaluating what you say based on what they already think about it. Prejudice, that's a good word for it. I'm already convinced that once saved, always saved is right. So if you say it's not, I'm thinking about what I think about it already. And I disregard what you're saying because I don't look at the Bible as the arbiter of all truth. My own mind governs what I say is truth. That's the damage of the gnosis. You know something already. But what you know is a lie. Look what he says in the rest of 2 Thessalonians. He says, look what he says. Verse 11. Well, verse 10. The devil is going to come. The Antichrist will come with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Why? That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The reason why you don't want to believe the truth is because you enjoy, you enjoy the rebellion. You like the sin. So you've made up a belief system that's going to do what? Accommodate your sinful life. So God made me a homosexual. That's blasphemy. I'm once saved, always saved. I'm committing adultery, but I got saved. So you make up a religious system to accommodate your rebellion and sin. That's garbage. None of us are perfect. We all sin. You're going to damn your soul believing that. Don't you know it's different? It's a difference between sin and being a sinner. You can commit a sin that's all about not doing something. You sh if the Holy Ghost answers you to pray this morning, you didn't. That's a sin because you didn't obey it. But that won't damn you. You can repent and say, God, I should have gotten prayed when you told me. So I'm praying now. And you can offset it and get back right with God immediately. But you didn't go and shoot a guy in the head. You see what I'm saying? There are sins of omission, sins of commission. 
But being a sinner means you're, you have the very nature and life type of a sinner. You haven't been born again. That's the difference. We all sin, but we all, we all aren't sinners. They don't like that. You think you're better than me. No, I've been born again. And I was tired last night and went to sleep when I should have prayed, but I fell asleep. That's a sin of omission. I can get back right with God quickly and say, God, I apologize. I sure went to sleep because I was tired. But hey, I'm going to spend my time this hour here tonight praying through. I mean, I, I got to get this thing done. Yeah. I'm, in, I'm still in, I'm in vertical relationships still. Yeah. I go out here to a hotel and pick up two hookers and get a fifth of liquor and three joints and hang out in the hotel tonight. I'm damned to hell in the morning. Mm-hmm. One is a sinner. One committed a sin. The other committed a sin. Everybody can commit a sin, but everybody ain't a sinner. Big difference. One is an act that you shouldn't have done. The other is a nature that you possess. You are the thing. You sin because you're a sinner. A saint can commit a sin and be forgiven because they're not a sinner. You know what's going to happen to the saint that sins? Conviction. The Holy Ghost is going to grab your guts and almost wring them out of your stomach. And you know when that thing tightened down on you, he, you shouldn't have said that. And you're going to be quick to say, Lord, hey, whoa, whoa, I want to apologize to the whole room. I feel this thing came on me. I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get back in God's good graces quickly. You're quick to repent. Because the Holy Ghost is in you and got a hold of you. He got a hold of you. You tie it down on your guts. What do you think is happening in praise and worship when that thing got a hold of you? That's because you've been born again. That doesn't happen when you was in the club as a sinner. But when that thing got a hold of you, you was in there crying. I don't even know why you're crying. Got a hold of you. It's because you've been born again. The Spirit of God can get a hold of you and shake you from the inside out because you got the life of God in you. And deep calleth unto deep and touches you. A sinner don't have that. A sinner sits around stoically and dead to God. He don't have no effect on him whatsoever. You're dead to God and alive to the stinking flesh in the world. And you can't pretend this is in you when it's not. Head knowledge is gnosis. You know about Jesus, but you don't have the life of Jesus. I came with head knowledge and called myself saved, but I've never been born again. If God don't conceive you, if he don't feel you, if he don't impart life to you, you're a dead man walking trying to pretend that you're saved. And what a frustrating life you really live trying to hang around Christians, trying to look in that saved when you're as lost as a ball in high weeds. That college education with those college flags flying, full of knowledge and information, got all kinds of data and statistics. You're a mathematician. You're a br- brilliant engineer. You're a physicist. You're a medical doctor. You're a nurse, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. Whatever you are, and you're full of knowledge. It don't bring a born-again life into you. Theologians are packing out seminaries, teaching people stuff. It's doctors of theology have never been born again. Got all the knowledge about history in the Bible. Can go all through all kinds of different data and information trying to impress you. I was listening to a guy preach one time at church. He was standing there preaching saying, well, uh, what I want to do now is bring to you an exegesis of this particular scripture. Now, some of y'all don't understand what that means, but I think, let's see here, Brother Johnson here, you under, you've been a seminary, you understand what that means. And what I want to do, what are you bringing it up for? If nobody understands it, what are you even missing it for? And then I want to call out you and Brother Johnson, two seminary graduates that knows what it means. That's all garbage. Folks like to see a PhD as the pastor. And the pastor hadn't even been born again. 
They worship institutionalized information, data, and knowledge from a stinking college, university, seminary, or whatever other junk you went to. Buddy, you got to be born again. He got two, three, four, twelve fishermen, tax collectors, and heathens, and imparted life to them. And they offended the Pharisees and Sadducees, calling them ignorant and unlearned men. I might be ignorant, I might be unlearned, but guess what? I got power over all the power of the devil, and you don't. I got the life of God flowing through my lungs. And buddy, you don't. With your degree. You can have all the degrees on a thermostat. But you ain't born again. That offends them. So guess what's going to happen? God's going to drop on the everyday common person with Holy Ghost power. And they can't do what you do. And they will want to persecute you and kill you. Because they ain't got the goods. Boy, I love God. I see what he's about to do. He's going to separate the wheat from the tares with power. He's going to fall on the wheat. And everybody faking it and trying to look like they're saved won't have any power. Now what do you do to try to pretend you're saved? When everybody in the room except me has power, how do I try to fit in with you? And you're glowing in the dark, raising the dead, casting out devils, healing the sick. The believers have come forth. You know, believers are manifest sons. That's why these signs follow them that believe. That's a separator. See, the word believer is a separating term. They have power to cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll have signs and wonders attesting to the fact that God is speaking through them. Now what do I do? They're trying to fit in. I deceive myself all down the trail trying to pretend I'm saved and now God is up the ante. He came upon the saints of God, the sons of God. The manifested sons are now on display. And I got no manifestation of sonship. Now talk all your knowledge and your book data and your Bible data and your information from the institution. Now come with all the, the, the statistics of how many sons were born of, 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 of Reuben's clan. Who cares? God is beautiful. Man, he's going to sign off on folk with demonstrated power that cannot be a, argued against. So show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. I don't come with enticing words of man's wisdom, the gnosis. I come with a demonstration of the spirit and power so your faith will stand in the power of God and not in what I know. It says when I come to town, I don't want to hear the words you're talking. Show me the power. That's what the apostle said. If you're going to talk to me, if you're going to come to me with some kind of a, a, a discourse or something I need to know, you show me your power. Or else don't talk to me. Because God appends power to folks that really know him. Can't you see the broad spectrum of separation that's coming on the church? When he falls on folks that he really has claimed as his own, those that are actually sons, and he turns them into manifested sons, and hypocrites are going to become what according to the Bible? Fearfulness has overtaken the hypocrites. The sinners who are sitting up in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has grasped the hypocrite. They were play acting all along. And now the manifested sons have stepped out from the midst of them. And they can't follow. Because you ain't got the power. God is profoundly wise. He's growing the church organically to endow the church with power from on high just like he did at Pentecost in the book of Acts. He grew those boys organically and then fell on them. And you couldn't join yourself to them if you didn't have the same spirit that possessed them. What's standing against this thing? 
the organic life that's growing in the hypocrites and those that are sodomites. Romans chapter 1 is telling you he's given them up and given them over to final reprobation as the life grows up in them. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and following. He says, the first give up is uncleanness. He says they come along and they looking at all the worldly junk that's down here. God has plainly showed him, him, them himself because creation shows it in verse 19 in Romans chapter 1. He says in verse 21, they didn't want to glorify God as God. They weren't thankful. They became vain in their imaginations. Foolish heart becomes darkened. They thought they were wise and they became fools. University and college graduate, you think you're wise without being born again. You're an educated fool. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things with your horoscope, with your Masonic images, with your sorority and fraternity images. And because you did all this garbage, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. You get sexual avarice and sexual filth. You become unclean. You're engaging in oral sex and anal sex and sodomy. You look at pornography. You hang around nasty, stinking people like yourself. You're a, you're a, a fraternity groupie now with all these guys having sex with you as a sorrow, a sorority girl at the frat house, servicing your frat brothers. Don't try to lie and say it don't happen on the campuses because you know that it does. Girls come to college, join sororities, have a, a fraternity, that's their, that's their brother fraternity, and the girls service them. All the girls go through the frat brothers like animals. Then graduate half crazy and a whore. I had a friend that had a girlfriend. Married, 23 years old, with, just had a baby. And still going to the frat houses on campus to serve at the frat guys. Young boys in, in the frat house. She's married, graduated with a child, and can't turn her loose of being a frat hole. Branded with the images, tattooed with the images. You're crazy. The devil has driven you crazy. I bring it up. The spirit in you controlling your mind makes you mad at me for saying it. You're given over to uncleanness. They changed the truth of God into a lie. They took the Bible and told you that God made me a homosexual. The truth of God is made into a lie. And worshiped and served the creature. You're caught up in folks more than God. The pastor is now your pimp. You're a whore sitting in a pimp house calling it church. The church, for the most part, has become a whorehouse. And the pastor is the pimp, giving the women HIV now. A HIV-infected pimp is your pastor. And you laying around with him. You serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. See, folks don't like this kind of point-blank talk. See, that's not politically correct. That's not... Uh, inclusive. That's not diverse. You don't show any tolerance. You seem like you're angry. You should be more subtle, more laid back, more tactful. See, they didn't teach us this in the seminary to talk like you taught. They taught us critical thinking. You know what critical thinking is? You get a book, you read it, and you become a person that criticizes it or you critique the book. So you find everything you like about it, and then you construct a research paper to show what you don't agree with. And then you argue the two points in the research paper or in the, in the thing you wrote, the thesis you wrote. And they grade you based on how, how your arguments made sense, and you drew conclusions as a critical thinker. You're a nut! 
Because you're going to approach the Bible that way. And you become a subjective thinker where you subject the Bible to your mind. What I bring to the table about it is what I get out of it. You are a kook because God's not going to subject himself to any human. For his, he's not in a test tube for me to come to conclusions about him. God tells me how it is and I bow the knee. A critical thinker. They turn folks into kooks writing research papers and then tell you if you get any information from somebody else and you copy it verbatim, that's plagiarism and it's an automatic failing grade. This, this, this place down here is a nut house. You better get with God and get your mind cleared of all that junk you learned in the, in the stupid school systems and get to know God as a person and not as a source of information and data that you got from him. You better know him because he's got to know you when he comes back. Now, I got to know you. Abraham knew him when he walked up on him. And you better know Jesus when he walks up on you. If not, you'll receive the Antichrist thinking it's Jesus. He warns us in 2 Corinthians 11, 4, there's another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit. You can receive the wrong one and think you got God. And call everybody that's trying to teach you to come to Jesus to know him for yourself a sorcerer. How are you going to be a sorcerer telling the people, go to the Lord for yourself. Get to know him for yourself. Don't put any trust in the arm of flesh. Don't worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Get to know the Lord on your terms so you know him when he appears. You will be saved by him because you have an, a, a personal relationship with him. The sorcerer don't like that, so he calls the person telling you that and warning you of that, the sorcerer, because they want to get your money and want to be worshipped by you as a sodomite. Beware of the unclean spirits that have gone forth with doctrines of demons to contaminate you and make you unworthy to walk with Jesus. This is all about the vertical you aligning yourself with Jesus, that you know him and he knows you. Every other form of fellowship and brotherhood will come into format as others know him like you do. Don't make conformity to people the litmus test for your salvation. Don't make membership in anything the litmus test for your salvation. I got to know him when he appears. Because when he appears, I shall be like him, for I shall see him as he is. For this cause God gave them up. Because they worshiped and served the, create, the creature born the creator. God gave them up unto vile affections. They become body idolaters. They worship the creature. Jennifer Hudson getting skinny is worshipped. Beyonce's bootylicious. She's worshipped. The creature. And you receive vile affections as a result. For even their women did change the natural use. That's referring to the female sexual organs, the natural use, into that which is against nature. A man and woman's body aligns by nature to accommodate sexual unions. You stand up facing a woman and your body will align with that woman by nature, the way God designed you to actually to engage in sexual unions. You got to stand on your head to get with somebody? That ain't by nature. That's a freak of nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, unnatural, perverted, and receiving in themselves that recompense or repayment of their error, error, like the robot on Lost in Space, error, error, error. It's wrong. It's an error. If a baseball player misses a ball hit to him, error. If you have 20 questions wrong on a 30-question test, you got 20 errors. 
You're doing wrong. You're going against design as a homosexual. Don't talk to me about trying to affiliate with you. Don't talk to, with me about trying to accommodate you. Don't talk to me about a man and a man being married together in error. It's the way it is. You don't like it? I'm sorry. It's the way it is. It won't change for you, me, or the president. Receiving in themselves the repayment of their error which was meet or do them. A repayment of their error which is do you. See, a paycheck is do you when you work. AIDS is do you when you commit this. Kidney failure is do you. Heart attack, stroke, high blood pressure is do you. Blindness is do you. Because you're receiving a repayment for your error. And even as they did not like to retain God in their gnosis, their knowledge, their knowledge is disavowing God, disallowing God. We don't want God in the school systems because we're teaching folk Greek and Roman culture. We're teaching them the wisdom of the Greek philosophers. We don't accommodate God and Jesus Christ here because we're teaching mind control that comes from the Greco-Roman Empire. You don't want to be too smart. So smart that you become dumb about God. They promote you due to you having succumbed to their brainwashing. We can trust, we can trust you because you're one of us. The they that Jesus talked about so many times, they will do things to you. He used the word they, I think, about 15, 20 times in one or two paragraphs. He's talking about these folk that have become brainwashed with Greco-Roman teaching. He says, they don't want to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over. He gave up on them. He gave up on Sodom and Gomorrah. I can't find anyone. He gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, meaning malignity means they're rotten to the core, a malignant tumor, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They make stars out of the renegades, the reprobates, the rebels. They pleasure, have pleasure in them that do the same things they do, and they exalt them and put them on pedestals. So Kim Kardashian makes a porno movie, and she's exalted as a, brand, a, a, a worldwide diva. Advertising lingerie in Sears. Naked, stand half naked there in Sears on a big poster, her and her two sisters advertising Sears, Kim Kardashian, the Kardashian brand. Having been in a porno flick, the world is looked at on the internet. And now you put before the people as somebody exalted as an icon. You know how warped that is? Whores, whoremongers, homosexuals, freaks, kooks, wackos, insane folks lifted up on pedestals as icons. And everybody just goes on down the road like everything's lovely. It all started back in Genesis chapter 3 when the devil told them to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You won't die. You'll know some things. And it makes you the enemy of God. When a relationship with God is removed from your heart and you begin to lift up your mind and knowledge, you are well on your way to becoming a homosexual. Because what you know will make you independent and make you proud. The Bible plainly tells us that knowledge will make you proud. It will puff you up. 
But love, a relationship of love with God will edify. It will build you up and build others up because you'll be selfless. This is the selfish life of a sodomite versus the unselfish life of a saint. I can sit here in this chair, I can go to the top of a mountain and yell this in a microphone on a bullhorn as loud as I can. But if your nature is not changed, you can listen, but you can't hear me. Because your very nature and what's in you can't hear it. You can be around it, but it can't absorb into you. Because it's blocked right at your mind. Everything that's told to you in life must be filtered through your mind to get into you. And if you've got that thing in you that can only think about what you think about what somebody says, you can't receive the engrafted word that's able to save your soul. Because your own mind is never able to concentrate on what God is telling you to have it absorbed into you to transform your life type into somebody that can really walk with God. That's terrifying. That you can sit right in the middle of this and never have it change you. You hang around it forever and you're just the same person you've always been. And like a dog, you'll go right back to your vomit. And like a pig, you'll wallow in the mire again having tried to pretend you were saved for a lot of years and never being changed. This thing is infallible. It's foolproof. God has it designed that your kind shall never enter into my presence again. The fallen man, the Adamic man, you'll never be around me again. Only if you're born again of the Spirit of God, gestated by God, transformed by God and manifesting God will you qualify to come back into his presence. It's an individual affair that cannot be faked. I can sit right here in your face and tell you this for 20 years and you never hear it. But you think in your mind you're for real. And all you got is what you know. Your conversations will center around what you know. But you can't get up and save anybody else. Because every life type, every seed reproduces after its own kind. How can you be saved and you never reproduce a Christian? You never see anybody born again. You never impact anybody's life. All you can do is circle in the wilderness of your own mind and talk about what you know with other folk like yourself forever. Man, this thing is about it. being a Philip and a, and, and a Stephen. They didn't talk about what they knew. They reproduced folk. I, ain't, I, don't, I don't have time to sit around a bunch of so-called Christians batting word back off. Of it. I'm here to take ground and get some folks saved. I ain't here to talk to y'all about nothing. What are we sitting around and you know, I'm just talking to each other about? What's to talk about? Nothing. If I've been born again. There's 7.2 billion people out there to be saved. And I'm responsible for it. Get on with the Father's work. Get on with the Master's work. You can't fake this. Folk hide out in church stuff. Hide out in a religious arena because they don't have the life. When you really got this life, you can go to Cincinnati today by yourself and save everybody in sight because you don't need nobody. You don't need no prop jobs with you. I save folk wherever I'm at because I got the life. You got the life. You don't need nobody with you. We need to get together. And now you get together with the mother folk like you. I'm getting ready to fly. And do some things myself I've been instructed to do. Well, we need to get together first of all and uh, come together and no, you do that. You and you and them. Yeah, y'all, yeah, y'all go, yeah, y'all need to do that. Y'all go ahead and do that. When you are an individually grown organic unit, you can be with or without. You don't need prop jobs, you don't need crutches, you don't need nobody hanging around. 
You're with the brethren, fine. You're alone, fine. It don't make no difference because that's not what you're flying with. You're led by the Spirit of God. You got the Holy Ghost as a dynamo in you to do the job. You go down to Puerto Rico alone and save a half a city. Paul will drop into a place, a human dynamo. John Mark don't want to go. He ain't ready to go leaving. Well, Barnabas says he ought to go. I leave you too. You ain't fooling around with all that, man. I ain't here to be your buddy, your pal, or your friend. I'm here to get a job done because I got this dynamo burning in me. I got something spinning in my belly about to drive me crazy, keeping me up at night. I ain't got time to argue with you about no John Mark. You and John Mark go ahead. I got things I got to do. That's how you got to approach this. It's a vicious, volatile life. I must be about my father's business. They came to Jesus trying to talk to him. What are you talking about? Son, where were you? We were looking for you. What are you talking about? No, you not that I must be about my father's business. What are you talking about looking for me? I don't need y'all looking for me. I'll get home when I get home. I'm just 12 years old telling you that. A dynamo. A dynamo. You better pray to God that you become a self-contained dynamo. Fellowship with the brethren ain't going to take no energy in. Because every brother that's got a dynamo in them will be able to fellowship with you. And not draw energy from you. Virtue will go out of you around people that ain't got no life. Don't you know that? You can feel the pull on you. Just pulling life out of you just like a vacuum hose sucking life out of you because they got no energy. They're trying to live off of you like a leech because they got no self-contained power. Dynamos don't draw from you because they got a dynamic power in them all by themselves. I don't need your life for me to live because I'm hooked up vertically to the God that's got all power. Leeches don't know what to do, got questions all the time, who in the world is going to be in an environment with dynamos and all you bring? It's like us going into the desert. Everybody lost in the desert. We stumble into the same place together, 10 of us. All right, Tom has got, what you got? I mean, I got 20 bottles of water with me I just had left over. Good. What you got, Barbara? I Man, I got some fruit I packed up, freeze dried, that I still got with me. I got about, let's see, I got a case of that here strapped to this camel. Good. What you got out there? Well, I brought, I got this dried lamb that I had in my knapsack. I got, I brought out, and I kept it with me. It's still good. We can still cook it because it's still, I salted it down so it's been preserved. In the desert, good. What you got, Gary? Well, I got problems. I got prayer requests, and I got needs. Well, what we're going to do is bury you out here in the desert and leave you as unfruitful and if you don't, you're not contributory to the whole cause. We'll leave you out here buried with your problems, prayer needs, and all this other junk you got. How can you always be the one that's got a prayer request, a need, and a problem and not contribute anything to the body, to edify the body? And everybody else in the desert brings something to the table to sustain the body. It's something wrong with you. If you always the person that's got a need and a problem, you're drawing energy from folk because you ain't been born again. You know, good and well, God is faithful to give everybody your portion, your birthright. Yes, always with the problem, always with the need, always needing some money from somebody, always needing something, always needing the prayer request. Always the one with something they got going is going wrong. Everything you bring up is a problem that you're going through. Well, what if I'm going through? Can you help me? No, I'm used to you always being the one to supply the need. Older folks and families that came up in the family. Watch out that young uh, older child a lot of times be the one that carried the whole child. Not necessarily the oldest child. It could be the most disciplined, the most uh 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 astute child, the one that's got the most uh, uh, wherewithal to survive down here. And the whole family would piggyback on that one child. You could be the youngest child in the family. Everybody come to you with all the problems. 
Because you carry the load. Not in Christ. Every man bears his own burden. Work out your salvation for yourself with fear and trembling. God is not carrying a bunch of leeches down the road. Burdening down everybody else with their leached out problems. Why should I envy Omar if Omar went and became an electrician? Omar went to school, got the credentials, got a job. He's pulling down his salary. And I sit around smoking dope, drinking liquor, and running whores all my life. Now I need him to help me. Well, why didn't I go to school? Why didn't I get his credentials? Why am I crippled? Because I didn't do what was necessary to get what I needed to actually advance in life and to be successful like him. And now he's responsible for me, not in God, not in God's economy. You've got to get to God and let God fulfill your destiny. I tell my little girl, I said, look, if you want to elevate, separate. If you want to get married, have a husband, marry somebody with some sense, but get somewhere in life that you become a plus to that guy and you don't draw from him. You got to be able to stand alone before you stand with somebody else. Why would he need you, an empty-headed, babbling, Nicki Minaj moron, and here he is with a doctorate degree and a nuclear physicist, and you walking around trying to recite Nicki Minaj poetry. Birds of a feather flock together. I'm just using that as an example. Nobody wants to take on a burden that had done anything for themselves in life. Most folk out there on food stamps, living un under the radar screen, screen, it's a result of what they did. And they didn't want to blame you and want you to carry the load. One young girl came through elementary school, middle school, high school, college, graduate school. And now she's interning out here at an organization pulling down six figures. Living next door to each other in the same uh, uh, housing project. Another girl sat there and had six, seven babies out of wetlock by seven guys on welfare, dropped out in the 10th grade. That girl that did what she did to advance old that girl sitting there in, the, in squalor and, and, and poverty, she owes her nothing. Well, that's, that's not the compassion and love of God. Yes, it is. You reap what you sow is what the Bible says. She closed the legs. She didn't have sex with a bunch of guys laying around and crazy. She invested in her education for her to progress out of the project. Now she's got a condo. Now she's got her car. Now she's got her furniture. Now she's got a wardrobe. And she's traveling for a business out there in, 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 in pharmaceutical sales. I can't begrudge that girl. Why are you putting her down? Why are you jealous of her? She sacrificed now for then. You laid around smoking the dope, drinking the liquor in the club, shaking your behind. And now you got the fruits of your labor. It's a separation down here no matter what arena you're going to, whether it be the, the, the body of Christ or any other arena. There are going to be astute, disciplined, highly trained Christians that have paid the price for the power of God. It's going to be folks watching them, wishing they were them. Which one will you be? God is going to visit, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going through the big easy. For the same reasons, they're down there in southern decadence, inviting homosexuals down there every Labor Day. He sent warnings. He's tried to tell them to stop. They think he's a joke. He can wipe out whole cities, wipe out whole nations without even raising his hand. He can just talk. And whole nations cease to exist. You know how much power you're talking about that's being rest restrained? You don't want to fool around with God. 
I'm one in the Big Easy. I'm one in Las Vegas. I'm one in New York City. I'm one in Atlanta. I'm warning Paris. I'm warning London. I'm warning Hong Kong, Beijing. I'm warning every nation. I'm warning every tongue, tribe, and nation on this planet. Stop playing with God. Stop playing with God. Get over your allegiances and your alignments and attachments to people, whether it be your kids or anybody else, because it's going to come down heavy, and you got to be detached from folk that ain't going where you're going. Remember, Lot's wife is what Jesus warned all of us. You think your, no, your emotions are normal when you're attached to these folk? You better change your emotions. You better sanctify your emotions and get with God to the they're changed over to reflect his emotion. There's a separation. There is a higher calling of God in Christ Jesus. If a man purge himself from these, he'll be a, a vessel complete and ready for the master to use. Talking about the vessels of dishonor in, the, in a great house. You can't afford to try to be like everybody else now. You want to maximize your potential in God and get on with doing what you're supposed to do. If I don't go, you go. It had nothing to do with me, what you do. I ain't trying to stand up with nobody talking about, well, I'm the pastor and the elder over you people, so therefore answer to me. Forget me. Push on past me. Get with God and reach the heights in God. Make Jesus your example. We got to get on with living the life of a Christian because it's been conceived, grown to the state that it transformed us and we're manifesting the life of Christ. Don't use anybody as your example for this. Jesus Christ in four gospels has shown you how you'll be. He went into the New Testament and used the apostles and the disciples to show you what your life would be like. That's the example for me to follow. I got to, until I, I'm doing exactly what he did because he said greater works will I do because he's gone to the Father. He laid hands on the sick, they recovered. Lazarus got up from the dead. I got to see this in my life take a hold of me. I want to see this life before I leave here. And he said, I'm coming back to see you, Sarah. According to the time of life, I'm, I'll be back. He'll conceive you through a born-again experience one day, but you better be assured of one thing. He's coming back to see you. To perfect those things that concern you, the Bible says. You got to grow, and when you grow to a place of maturity, he'll be back to see you because he got the birth out of you, what he put in you. I got to be a manifested son. Down the big easy, they're scared to death of manifested sons. Groveling in the streets and sodomites at the, at the Southern Decadence Festival with all those thousands of homosexuals in town. Their worst case scenario is for the two angels to come into town. And now the deal is done. God sent me here to wrap this up. Get this thing down in you. It's about Christ in you, the hope of glory. We talked about Sodom, Gomorrah, and New Orleans, which is the big easy. A laid back, jazzed up lifestyle where everything's just easily entreated. We just laid back down here eating crawfish, lobster, and shrimp, living the life of a Cajun laid-back society. But God, but God is coming to see you. And Christ comes to see this world and visit this world through his church. Cut all ties to whatever's binding you. Let it go, man. Let this stuff go. Your emotions get wrapped up in junk and it's going to bind you down to the here and now in this world. Sever those ties so you'll be free to move and you're not bound to anything or anybody. And for God's sake, stop sitting up and thinking about what you think about what the gospel says. Thinking about what I think about what the gospel says. Man, you better come at the empty picture and be filled in this. I don't think anything about it. I come empty to be told the truth of this Bible.
and I receive it as God doles it out to me. Father, we thank you for this time of sharing. Thank you for the word of God. God, take these words and everything that be from the throne of God, yoke it to us, join it to us, bind it to our hearts to transform us as individual vessels fit for you, you to use. It ain't about looking around now. Up, down, back, and forth, side to side. It's about being filled with the Holy Ghost of God that I can bring forth the life of God. Save those that you've ordained for eternal life through me to fulfill my mission on the vertical before the throne of God to be accounted worthy to escape. All these things coming on the earth. You said there's a worthiness that must take hold of us to come out of here. I want to be worthy in that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you back here next week. Stay in prayer. Remember the prayer line every night, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And just be mindful of the whole operation because this is real. It's real. Organic life is what we're after. Right now, I'm in the middle of writing a book called The Organic Gospel. I'm about seven, eight chapters deep into it. And I'll be asking for some people to help transcribe it. Anybody listening to this by way of the broadcast or stick them? I need transcribers. Usually, Maisha does this, but she's kind of busy. She's been dealing with uh, being sick and that kind of thing. I don't want to put this stuff on her by herself. So if anybody has the time to transcribe this book, it's, for, it's going to be in recorded format. It has to be transcribed into a paper format for us to join the parts together and get it ready for actual publication. But you can't be a transcriber and be a person that's not able to actually command the English language because you have to be able to take what's said on the tape and change it into viable language in written form. You see, because I might say something that you have to have the knowledge to actually take English and actually make it come forth and state it better. And Maisha is very astute at doing this, but if you're not able to do that, don't kid yourself. I'm not talking about a typist. I'm talking about a transcriber, somebody that can use the basics of English and make it into a written format that's understandable. Also, I intersperse a lot of uh, passages of scripture in it. So I might say in the message something like uh, inject or place Isaiah chapter 4 verse 8 right here, which means you'll have to take the Bible and place it in there and then know how to work in the information after that in a way that's going to make sense without me saying it. So it's a lot that goes into this that everybody can't do. So I'm not looking for like a typist, just people who are able to actually use uh, the basic knowledge of English and, and, and things of that nature, use a thesaurus or, or a dictionary or a, whatever you got to use to make it make sense, flying solo without somebody telling you. So that's what we're looking for. If anybody's available for that kind of a work that's, that's going to take some brain power, uh, contact me and uh, I'll get the information to you. But I appreciate it, y'all. We appreciate your support. Those of you who, are, who have been financially helping us, we got people all around, a couple up in Marietta. You know who you are at the construction firm. We appreciate you. Uh, Pierre, Pierre Dungey up in Chicago every week, just like clockwork, you're helping us. We appreciate you. Uh, Lonnie down in uh, New Orleans and him in winter, we appreciate you. I'm just giving people, there's a lot of different people I could thank, but I'm just talking about those of you that in a disciplined format every week help without being asked, not being told, just appreciating the message enough to want to see it go. That's who we're talking to. Keep going, keep doing it, and we're praying that God all the time, we pray that God will reward you and, and, and repay you and return it to your, you a hundredfold, whatever you do. To help this thing go. Not to mention the people here that are sacrificially doing what you do. God is faithful to take account of what everybody does if this thing be found in righteousness. Also pray for the people down in the Virgin Islands. They're getting set up down there. They already got some people involved to help and they're moving forward. So pray for them as they go forward that uh, everything aligns itself properly as we wave into the um, we bring a tidal wave on shore into the Virgin Islands in February to do a work down there. It's time to get rolling, time to do what we got to do, sweep across this globe, bring that circle through the earth to reap so God can 
cut this thing short in righteousness and end a failed human tragedy. That's all it is now. It's wrapping up. It's a failed human tragedy. And it's time to save these people and bring them over to the Lord's side. We make no apologies for that. It is what it is. Look at society as a whole. We can see what's happening. And God is enlisting a salvation army for this end time move. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you back here next week. Have a good week.